Okay, the, the most important thing that I have to say is first and foremost that, that the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ loves sinners. And um, anyone who's filled with the Spirit of the Lord has a great love for people. And so it, there's a lot of problems that exist in the church. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about alcohol because it's problematic throughout the world wherever it exists in any society, it corrupts, it's a problem. And you, you're gonna really be struggling to make something that is certainly bad, good. You cannot make something that is wrong, right. And, and if you can just you know, receive just a basic principle like that instead of trying to come up with all of these ideas about how somehow the Bible makes it right because the Bible does not make alcohol right. It doesn't make it right in any way. But it's just so, so important for me it, when I'm talking about things that are wrong, things that are bad, things that are sin, that people aren't taking it as it were, that we're leveling some accusation, some hatred towards them as individuals. Satan is ruthless. He's ruthless in his deception. He's ruthless in his ultimate goal to destroy people's lives. Let me just say this. People think that they're going to be tormented by Satan, and that is be, be, believers, people who believe in a hell, in a heaven, that they're going to be tormented by Satan and by demons when they go to hell. Well, that is certainly true, but it does not happen, or Satan doesn't wait to then. He's tormenting people now, and we see that everywhere. And so we've got to understand it is a demonic influence that creates the sin. And so when Paul addresses sin in Galatians chapter 5, he's addressing a demonic power that is at work against people. And people have to be equipped to know how to withstand that demonic influence. And the, great, the good news, the great thing is this, that Christ Jesus came to save sinners. That specifically means as the Savior, he came to deliver that means to set free. He came to, first of all, liberate us from the prison, then change our heart and change our spirit so that we could agree with His Holy Spirit and enjoy the good things that belong to the kingdom of God, that belong to life. God came to give us life. I think that if there's any message that needs to be heard and needs to be preached to the people that sit in church is this, receive the life of Christ. Because there's a lot of folks running around believing that they know God and they simply do not have the manifestation nor the witness that they have the life of Christ Jesus in them because that's an abundant life. That's the God kind of life that is by nature and quality eternal life. And we get lost in this concept of eternal life and we think based, based on semantics that we understand it, but eternal life is God's life. It's the life of God. It's the life of Jesus Christ. It's the life of the Spirit. And, and there is absolutely nothing that belongs to the demonic world it contained within that life. It, once that demonic realm is it infiltrates that life, if you would, that life ceases to exist. There is an absolute separation between the realm of the spirit of the living God and the realm of demon spirits. And John put it like this. He said that he that sins is of the devil. It's a radical verse of scripture in First John chapter three, verse seven. And um, we know that Jesus Christ was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And, and I want to put it like this. It's impossible to engage in sin without being influenced and cooperating with demon spirits. Though that sin may be birthed in the heart of an individual out of a desire, ultimately it is a part of a realm which you cannot isolate demon spirits from. They abhor that vacuum. They are going to be there. And when you look at drunkenness, and of course this is where it really pairs out. Folks say, well, I drink but I don't get drunk. Well, hold up a second. Drunkenness means from the Greek language, methe, literally means to be intoxicated. So let's just be reasonable about the whole thing. If you get pulled over by a policeman and does a breath analysis and decides whether or not you are drunk, 
or whether or not you are intoxicated. That is equivalent to just a little over one glass of wine. And that's depending upon what kind of wine you're drinking because if you're drinking the model, uh, the, the modern uh, model distillates, that would take less than one glass of wine. Now let's real quickly just jump back to biblical days and talk about wine. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, nobody buys a bottle of wine that was um, uh, made in Israel because they're not known for making some high quality intoxicant so that we can all run around and, you know, party with. Um, They um, ultimately bottled grape juice that certainly became uh, a, a, a alcoholic in a in a reasonable uh, content of alcohol based upon how they their recipe for making it which would have been at the most i mean stretch it out there stretch it way out there four percent but it was more like two and a half percent now understand this and all jews all orthodox jews all hasidim all hasidic jews recognize that what i'm getting ready to say all haradim everybody from that culture recognizes that what i'm going to say is true even unto this day that if you had wine that had an alcohol any kind of wine uh, and, and let me just say this, wine turns to vinegar, vinegar by the, the nature of the chemistry very, very quickly. But if you had any kind of wine, it didn't matter if it was fresh grape juice or if it was uh, had, tur- had fermented and turned alcoholic or if it had already then uh, degraded to, to the vinegar content, you still, to make sure that you did not get intoxicated, you diluted that one to three. Even the ancient Greeks who taught virtues said, demanded those who pursued any kind of virtue in their life and had a value and a quality and a commitment to society would dilute their wine so that they didn't become drunkards and then have the ultimate consequences in society, the decay of all the morality and family and the rest of the things that we already know that alcohol creates and causes look it is just not even debatable it, there's too much data on the whole issue let's be reasonable and the greeks diluted one to seven i even read of one greek ancient greek writer who recommended one to ten now what i would in charge what i would in- encourage you to do is this take your alcohol that you believe that you have the liberty to drink and dilute it one to three and how does that taste how, how does that work for you okay it's not going to give you what you want because let's be honest you want an effect you want to feel intoxicated so let's just let's just push all the nonsense aside you want to get high and that's why you're doing it. and the big question is what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your life that you want to get high because jesus come to give you life and he's come to give it to you more abundantly you shouldn't have to need to any need whatsoever to get high and i'm going to say this we have discovered over and over again that when someone is under the influence of alcohol and they want to give their life to jesus we can take authority over a demon spirit and they can be delivered from the intoxicating effect and sober up so i'm telling you i have reason and very clear proofs here from an experiential model not just what the the bible is uh, is superior to all reason experience but i'm just saying bring it into our everyday life i can cast that devil out and a person gets sober we deal with alcoholics all the time and we discovered that we have the cure for alcoholism not a 12-step program but a changed heart in the name of jesus christ by the power of the holy ghost that demon stronghold goes so how then are you going to sanctify that which a demon spirit is produced and created and i believe even in its effect the very effect is not some physiological chemistry that goes with on within the anatomy of a human being but literally is a sensation supplied by a demon spirit i know these are pretty radical thoughts you can't write me off i've got 
lots and lots of verses of scripture that I could discuss. And I just thought I'd just take this moment just to try to reason with you a little bit. And let me just say this to you, Christian. The statistics are this. Not everybody has the same level of what's called alcohol dehydrogenase, and that's how our bodies are able to deal with an ethanol or alcohol content that comes in our body so we can break it down and our body can go on with normal, everyday, healthy life, okay? Because you're putting a poison. A ethanol is a poison. It's a poison. Everybody defines it a poison. Sanctify a poison. Make a poison good for you. Impossible. Give me a break. Now listen to this. The Lord Jesus said it would be better that you had not entered into life than to, to put a stumbling block before your brother, before the least of your brethren, before anyone. Now think about this. There is a statistic that is very clear within the framework of humanity. There is approximately one out of every 10 people that once they take a sip of alcohol, they will become an alcoholic. And they watched you, preacher, leader, teacher, spiritual person, take a sip. And so, therefore, they took a sip too. And then you beat them with a stick of religion, saying they would be religious and don't be like religious people, and as, as though they were being initiated out of religion into whatever it is that you're, you're touting. They take this sip, and they become an alcoholic, and their life is ruined. And it's on your head. Jesus said it's on your head. And then this whole notion that we're legalists, let me just tell you, fundamentally, the whole concept of legalism is this. It is to believe in the law of Moses for righteousness. In fact, let me just say this. I don't know any Christians today who believe in the law of Moses for righteousness. In fact, I think that some people ought to have a little bit of legalism in their life or something. I mean, not really, but it, it would at least bring more morality. No one's trusting in the law of Moses. No one's walking around that committed to God to where that they're sacrificing that much on a daily basis. Legalism is to trust in the law of Moses for righteousness. Nobody's saying that. Nobody's touting that when we talk about get rid of alcohol out of your life. It shouldn't be in your life. You should have no need to get high. You should be so full of the Holy Ghost. You got more joy than you know what to do with. It's, go, it's pumping out of you. It's running, flowing out of you like rivers of living water. I mean, you're so filled up with God, you got room for nothing else. Give me a break. This alcoholism it, uh, uh, notion, it's a game. All of this stuff that people are saying, it's a lie. It's not real. You're deceiving yourself. You got to rest recognize that Satan is a master of his craft. He's a master deceiver. And for you to believe that alcohol is good is simple deception on every level. Sensibly, it's deception. Biblically, it's absolutely deception. We're not talking about legalism here. We're talking about doing what's right and doing what's wrong. There was nothing legalistic about Jesus. There's nothing legalistic about any word in the New Testament in any way. We don't trust in the law of Moses for our righteousness. We trust in Jesus Christ for our righteousness. We trust in a changed heart filled with the Holy Ghost, totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit for righteousness. And I'm telling you, don't be drunk. Don't be intoxicated. One sip puts a level of intoxication. And that is, is based upon your level of alcohol dehydrogenase that's different for everybody but nonetheless listen to me listen any alcohol will result in intoxication don't be intoxicated with wine we got something better for you we come to offer you life and life more abundantly we come to give you something that was freely given to us as a free gift right out of heaven because god so loves the world he gave his only begotten son we come to give you a free gift that was freely given to us when jesus supernaturally stepped into our life by the power of the holy ghost he changed everything about us he filled us up with every good thing we want you to know this religion listen to me there's a lot of people talking about us being religious because we don't drink alcohol no 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 you're religious let me help you understand this religion is 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 trying to interact with God without any kind of a reciprocation.
You can't have, we're talking about a relationship, and you can't have a relationship without reciprocation. And when God, when you allow God through Jesus Christ to give you this kind of relationship with Him, there will be a reciprocation that will fill you up with so much goodness because that's who the Father is. So much joy, so much peace, so much love. I'm going to tell you, alcohol will not be a high to you. It will be an insult to your spirit. It will be an insult to your body. It will be an insult to your mind. It will be an insult to your conscience because it's an insult to the Holy Spirit who is the spirit of holiness and there's nothing legalistic about him. He's got everything that belongs to the law of the spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. These are the laws of God that are the laws of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, mercy, everything that belongs to uh, righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. And we pray in Jesus' name that that becomes a reality to you and that you don't need to get stoned anymore, man. You don't need to get high because I'm telling you, sin will make your heart more and more deceitful. And ultimately, once you buy into one line of Satan, you're going to buy into another one and you're going to go get past the place of even being convicted by the Holy Spirit anymore. And you ultimately run the risk of finding yourself so ensnared by Satan. What Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 could become a reality in your life as well and you don't want to run the risk and that is because they did not like or want to retain the knowledge of God. What is the knowledge of God? It's what Father believes. It's what He thinks. It's what He demands because they did not want to retain the knowledge of God. What the Word of God describes to us to show us and lead us in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake because they did not want to retain the knowledge of God in their heart. They were given over to a mind void of all ability to interact with and know the living God. Don't let that be you. It's not worth it. Alcohol is not worth it. I'm going to say this one last thing just before I close. I'm going to say this. I know someone uh, in, in leadership in a, in a major church and, and they read my article on alcohol in the church and, and they scoffed at it and they decided they didn't like me and I was too old fashioned and I belonged to, you know, I, I was, I, was um, uh, I should have been born a hundred years earlier, you know, and all this other thing. But at any rate, he read the article, he threw it, threw it down as, as nonsense and what happened was he was coming back from his leadership meeting, one of the large churches in America, coming back from his leadership meeting, and he recognized that if he was, would have been pulled over by the police, he would have been arrested for drunk uh, dr driving under the influence of alcohol. And he was more than just uh, a little intoxicated because he had had four or five mixed drinks, not wine, because wine's going to take you to, to rum. And you already know that because you're already drinking rum if you're doing this and you're saying this. You're already drinking this mess. You're already in it. And, 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 and he drank four or five mixed drinks. And that, that night, he pulled off to the side of the road and he asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive him. The word uh, that he had read in Alcohol in the Church became a living reality reality to him because something more than my ability or any other human being's ability convince you of these things took hold of him that night. He opened up his heart just a little bit and the spirit of truth, God the Holy Ghost, came and convict, convicted him of his sin, convinced him of the righteousness that God demands of our life, the, the, the good kind of life, the, the life that is not going to have sin and sickness and, and disease and death in it, but is going to be filled with every good thing, convinced him that there was a much better life for him to be living. He repented and he, he sent me a letter the next day saying it's over, I'll never drink alcohol again. And two, three years later, I, I think it's been about three years now, he, once again, he's, he's, he gave no more room to that demon power to influence his life. And we pray in Jesus' name right now that you give no more room either. I set you free from the power and the influence of that demon spirit we call alcohol. Never again will you have a taste for it and never again will you have a need for it because right now in Jesus' name, be filled with the Spirit. Amen.